de eh, interactivo. Les digo estamos, que ya estáis. Que estamos a puntito sí. de pasarles el link de YouTube. Perfecto, jo, esto es un esto Milagro. sí que es un timing que alucinas. Es alucinante <risa> el poder de la oración. Estamos todos en Pachi, estamos todos en Zoom, está también Esteban. Ah, ¿Nos ves? ¿Nos oyes? ¿No está aquí? Vale, cuando puedas, nos das, por favor, el link de YouTube. Venga, un abrazo. Os puedo compartir que Pachi está enfermo, ya enfermo dos días, ayer tuvo un accidente de moto. Eh, ano, anteayer, eh, ahora mismo está en el baño. No sé, o sea, imaginaos, o sea, eh, eh, pero es que está siendo dos días. Entonces yo le he dicho, en, bueno, le he dicho, en cuanto termines esto, te vas. Tres días de vacaciones. Esto es. En fin. Es alucinante, es para contarlo, ¿eh? Sí, de hecho, Rafa cuenta algunas cosas. Eh, Pachi, bienvenido. Sí, hola, hola. Esteban, Pachi, ¿Cómo? abros. Vale, el enlace. ¿Y qué contigo? ¿Vale? Muy bien, directo, ¿no? Ana, tú y yo no salimos, o, o no todavía, Pachi, Esteban. Eh, yo, per yo, yo personalmente, no, está muy negro, uy. yo personalmente, Miguel Ángel, ah, yo personalmente, eh, Miguel Ángel, hasta que no empiece a salir bien, me siento más segura aquí, luego ya me salgo inmediatamente, en el momento en que yo empiece a ver a Christopher y vea que esto funciona, lo apago para que no cause interferencias, no obstante y como precaución para evitar interferencias, me he conectado a Zoom con el móvil, y no con el ordenador como hice ayer, ¿sabes? Vale, para que no vale, haya líos. Tienes, lo tienes muteado cuando empieza lo tienes lo te... muteado por los dos sentidos ¿eh? Efectivamente, sí, 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 sí. Vale, y eh... ¿Dónde me has enviado el código, eh, Esteban? Ah, vale, pensé, pensé, vale, pensé que, me, que me, habías, me, ibas a enviar, me ibas a enviar. Vale. Eh, vale, efectivamente ahora mismo está. No, no, training. Vale, sí, tenemos que cambiarle el nombre. Bueno, meeting, live, meeting lo, online. Lo cambio, yo, lo cambio yo, lo cambio yo. Meeting. Vale. Live, The Power of Sexual, ¿no? Sí. The Power of Sexual Education. Vale. Eh, listo. Oculto. Guardo. Vale. Mi transcripción. Tengo enlace. Tengo un enlace. Tengo el enlace. El enlace eh, les hace falta a los de la plataforma de interactivo, ¿eh, Pachín. Enseguida que lo tengas, pasándolo por chat, un WhatsApp, por ejemplo. No, ayer quedamos en que no. Para que no se acople de ningún modo, se van de aquí. Ellos cogen la imagen. Ellos pinchan YouTube, no pinchan Zoom. Eso lo, lo convenimos ayer, ¿te acuerdas? Ah, pues no lo sabías entonces. Pero ayer convenimos, había muchos ecos. Quitamos. ¿Y tenía algo que ver también con la latencia o no, Miguel Ángel? También, ganábamos el, la, la latencia que era más Había caro... muchos, seis, seis segundos. O sea, me oían a mí antes que al orador. Seis segundos antes, ¿no era así? En un momento dado alguien lo cronometró y dijeron no, que oían la traducción seis segundos sí, antes sí. que al orador. Yo no, yo, o sea, yo no escuchaba la traducción, lo que me di fue eh, desde que hablaba Jason hasta que llegaba, sí que eran seis, siete segundos. 
Vale, perdón, ah. perdón, perdón una cosa. A ver, ya, ya estamos, estamos ya en directo, ¿vale? Estamos, o sea, eh, se está transmitiendo bien, ¿vale?
trial. 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 Trial.
Hola, buenos días a todos. Desde el Instituto de Desarrollo y Persona de la Universidad Francisco Victoria y junto con el Theology of Body Institute de Filadelfia, os damos a todos la bienvenida a esta conferencia sobre el poder de la educación sexual. De contar con nosotros a Christopher West, que nos ofrecerá sus reflexiones sobre este tema. Y quiero deciros que no sabéis la que hemos pasado para conectarnos hoy porque hemos tenido todo tipo de problemas, la web que se cae, la luz que se va a la universidad, pero gracias a Dios tenemos un súper equipo de profesionales que han estado en todo momento trabajando para que este momento se pudiera tener. O sea que ante las adversidades nos hemos crecido y creo que podemos tener este evento. Como bien sabéis, esta primera intervención de Christopher West es en directo, y podéis acceder, así, si lo deseáis, a la traducción simultánea en español. Esta misma conferencia será grabada y posteriormente se subirá a la plataforma en su versión original. Además, sabéis que hasta el sábado 11 de julio a las 20 horas de España podéis acceder a otros vídeos pregrabados por expertos del Chio B Institute y del Instituto de Desarrollo y Persona sobre este mismo tema, que es teología del cuerpo y educación afectivo sexual. Por último, eh, deciros que en la plataforma encontraréis dos sorpresas más. El anuncio del próximo curso de teología del cuerpo en español y una invitación para acceder, para participar en el curso de experto universitario en afectividad y sexualidad. Yo... He sido alumno de la primera edición y si eres padre de familia, educador o te dedicas a la pastoral juvenil, creo que esto es un imprescindible. Y sin más, paso a presentaros a un gran amigo, a un gran profesor, a un gran padre de familia y sobre todo pues a un hombre de Dios. Good morning, Christopher, and thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here with us today. We know that you are a very busy man, but every time that the Instituto or the university asks you for help giving a conference, we talk, you have always been there for us. As a matter of fact, we should have had our first UB1 in Spain during these days. Unfortunately, the coronavirus obliged us to cancel all the events. God knows why, and today, We have more than 6,000 people connected to this conference, much more than we could expect in a presential mode. And this, I'm sure, it will help us to prepare our first TOB1 in Spain next year. Today, the topic of the talk is the power of sexual education. And as one of your friends will say, Michael Weinstein, In one word, this is going to be fascinating. This is what is going to happen today. And just before beginning, a little explanation for all our audience about how the conference is going to happen. Christopher will be speaking without interruptions. There are no questions during the event. If you want to submit any question, it will be answered except by the EDIP team. Once Christopher is finished, I will and at this conference and said goodbye to all of you. And uh, as all our students are here to listen to you, not to me, I will now silence my microphone so you can transmit to all of us your thoughts, your experience, your wisdom on this topic that is so important nowadays because of all the influence of the mass media and internet. Christopher, the audience is all yours. Thank you, Raphael. It's so good to be with all of you. I wish I could be in Spain in person this summer, but as Raphael said, uh, the coronavirus, coronavirus has prevented that. Uh, but I'm so glad that we have this technology that allows me sitting right here in my office in Pennsylvania in the United States to reach so many of you. Uh, and I wish also that I spoke your beautiful Spanish language. I do not. So we are relying on the translators to do a good job here. And uh, I'm very grateful to them as well. 
as Raphael said, the presentation today is on the power and the importance, I wanna underscore the word importance of sexual education within the family in particular. That's what we wanna talk about today. The power and importance of sexual education within the family. Now, I, I wanna begin by looking at those two words, sexual and education, right? To educate, if you pick apart that word, if you look at its roots, it means to lead forth, to call out, to lead forth, education. If you are leading someone, you have to ask the question, where are you leading that person, right? And if you are a leader, we have to ask the question, whom are you following? You are following whom? Right? If we are following the culture and its message about sexuality, then we are, if I can put it frankly, to quote the words of Jesus, if we're following the culture, we are the blind leading the blind. Right? To educate means to lead forth. If we have been educated by the culture, if we have been led by the culture, and if we are following the culture's message, we are the blind leading the blind when it comes to educating our children. And let's look at the word sexuality. How does the culture understand the word sexuality? Today, the culture is promoting an infinite number of sexual identities and orientations, right? What the church holds out to the world is that sexual identity is oriented towards the infinite. There are not an infinite number of sexual identities and orientations, but rather sexual identity, which means male and female, he created them. That's our sexual identity. You're either male or you're female. That truth orients us towards the infinite. This is where we want to lead people. This is proper, true sexual education. Remember, education means to lead forth. Where are we leading them? <laughs> we want to lead them to the infinite. We want to educate others to understand that our creation as male and female, as scripture says, is a great mystery. And it refers to something infinite. I, I often tell the story, if you've heard my presentations before, maybe you've heard me tell the story, but it's very fitting to, to set a frame for us for our conversation. So there were some young lovers one night, uh, full of passion for one another. It was a beautiful starlit night. They decided to drive out into the countryside to find a quiet private place under the stars where they could express their passion for one another. Well, little did they know they were on the property of a country parish and an elderly priest heard a little commotion, saw some lovers heading over the hill with a blanket and he decided he would go for a prayer walk. <laughs> Approaching these young lovers who had no idea someone was coming until they heard Psst! And they looked up very startled to see someone with a Roman collar standing right in front of them. They thought they were going to be scolded. They thought they were going to be chastised or shamed. But the old holy priest simply asked the young lovers a question. He said, tell me, what does what you're doing here have to do with the stars. This, my brothers and sisters, is what true sexual education unfolds for us. What does our creation as male and female have to do with the stars? What does it have to do with the eternal, with the infinite, with our ultimate destiny? That's what we want to look at today. If we only have a biological understanding of sexuality, we will reduce sexual education 
to the question, where do babies come from and matters of anatomy and plumbing, so to speak, right? Sperm and egg, that is all very important and valuable information, right? But the biological is not merely biological. The biological is also, and more importantly, theological. Our bodies tell a divine story. That's what we un want to unfold in any authentic sexual education. What is the divine story that our bodies unfold? And how do we unfold this story within the family? If you are like me, this touches on some painful experiences. When I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, I was born in the late 60s, uh, grew up in the 70s and was a teenager in the 80s. My parents, God bless them, you cannot pass to the next generation what was not given to you. It's a basic principle. You cannot give what you do not have. My parents did not have a very good, solid sexual education, so they couldn't lead me. And I was raised on what you might call, when it, when it comes to this hunger we all feel for love, for union, for intimacy, for affirmation, that, that deep hunger that has the name eros, E-R-O-S, right? Eros is that hunger, that thirst for love and union. When I was being educated, I was educated in what you might call the starvation diet gospel. If you're familiar with my work, you've heard this metaphor before. Um, the basic message that I got growing up, both in the family and in my Catholic school system, it went something like this. The basic message was your desires are bad. They're suspect. They're only going to get you in trouble. So you need to repress all of those desires. And then you need to follow this long list of rules. Most of them, thou shalt not. Right? And then you'll be a good Christian. Well, I don't know about you, but that didn't satisfy. <laughs> that did not appeal to my hunger and my yearning and my, my desire. So I became a convert to the secular culture's education. And I was educated by the secular culture in what I call the fast food gospel. And that's the promise of immediate gratification of the hunger, right? I don't know about you, but if the only two choices for my hunger are starvation on the one hand and fast food on the other, I'm going to take my hunger to the chicken nuggets because I'm hungry. And don't lie to me. The chicken nuggets taste very good going down, especially when you're really hungry, right? But what happens if fast food becomes your steady diet? Yes, it tastes good going down, but eventually the grease and the sodium is going to catch up to you and you're going to feel pretty sick. That's a picture of me in my college years. I was very sick, spiritually speaking, from all of the grease and the sodium. Again, it's a metaphor. I, I, I had bought into the secular message about indulging my sexual desires however I saw fit. And there was an initial excitement and an initial pleasure to that, but it left me very sick inside. It left me very pained inside. And there was a wake of wreckage. Not only was I causing my, myself pain, it was causing other people a lot of pain as well. And I had to look honestly at that pain. And that pain put me on my knees in a college dorm in 1988, saying, God in heaven, if you exist, you better show me why you gave me all these desires because they're getting me and everybody I know into a hell of a lot of trouble. Jesus said, seek and you will find. So I sought and I sought and I sought. And what I eventually found is a teaching of St. John Paul II called the Theology of the Body. And St. John Paul II was the first person to tell me that my desires, that deep hunger that I grew up thinking was bad and suspect, he was the first person to tell me, no, that hunger is good. 
and God put it in you to lead you to the stars. Here's my own analogy. I like to say that God gave us erotic desire to be like the fuel of a rocket, a rocket that has the power to launch us to the stars, to the eternal, to infinity and beyond. But you see, there's an enemy who doesn't want us to reach the stars. And his goal from the very beginning was to invert our rocket engines. What happens if you set off a rocket with inverted engines? Well, we all have inverted engines. It's what theologians call original sin, right? Original sin inverted our rocket engines. This is why we so often go out into the world looking for love, looking for happiness, looking for joy, but our efforts backfire on us and they cause us and others a lot of pain because our rocket engines are inverted. Here's the good news of the gospel. This is what I learned from St. John Paul II, and it radically changed my life. Christ came into the world not to condemn those with inverted rocket engines. He came into the world to redirect our rocket engines to the stars, right? Christianity proclaims not salvation from the flesh, but the salvation of the flesh. Christianity proclaims not the rejection of sexuality, but rather the redemption of sexuality. And of course, the word redemption indicates that something has gone wrong. And indeed, it has. Something has gone wrong. Our rocket engines have become inverted which means we can't just simply follow sexual desire as we experience it. Because if we do that, it will backfire on us and will cause ourselves and will cause many other people a lot of pain, right? Rather, sexual education to lead forth within the family and in society in general, a true sexual education is precisely in education, in what it means to learn how to redirect those rocket engines to the stars. This is what we want to try to begin to unfold in our, our time together here. Of course, we only have, I'm looking at my clock here, we have only about 40 minutes left. So we're only going to be scratching the surface of the surface to make a few points to provide some food for thought and some considerations that I hope will point you in the right direction. But my goal here is just to encourage you, to hopefully point you in the right direction and then send you on your way. Obviously in a short presentation, we can't do much more than that. So there are gonna be two parts here. The next 40 minutes, we're gonna look a little more specifically at what is the divine plan for sexuality? And then how do we pass it on within the family? Those are the two things we wanna look at. What is the divine plan? How do we pass it on? Again, please keep in mind, I'm just scratching the surface here. Here is my favorite image for sharing the divine plan. I want you to imagine that this piece of paper is the most beautiful painting you've ever seen in your life. What is it a painting of? Well, what is the most beautiful thing God has created, right? All of creation. If you look out your window, as I'm doing now, look out your window. All of creation tells a divine story. We need to learn how to see and hear the divine story that's written into all of creation. Think about it. <laughs> One of God's favorite subjects in all that he has created is mating and fertility. The whole universe is organized so that planet Earth could be life-giving. If planet Earth were one mile closer to the sun, 
no life would be possible. If planet Earth were a mile further away from the sun, no life would be possible. The whole placement of planet Earth in the cosmos is what allows life to come forth, right? Scientists tell us that about 375 million years ago, the Earth was a colorless blob. What brought color to planet Earth? It was the sexual differentiation of the plant kingdom. Flowering plants brought color to planet Earth. What is the, the mystery of a flower? <laughs> the flower is the reproductive organ of the plant. This is why we love flowers. This is why we love the smell of flowers. It's telling a divine story. What divine story? It's telling the story that God is life-giving love. That's who and what God is. John Paul II says, God is not a solitude. God is a life-giving family, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The love they share, the Father and the Son share this eternal love called the Holy Spirit. There is this eternal spy-rating love between Father and Son, and the Father is eternally generating the Son in the Holy Spirit. There is this eternal generation of life within God that is the Son, the Father generating the Son in the Holy Spirit. Look at creation. If we have eyes to see, every blade of grass tells the story of life-giving love. Every bird song tells the story of life-giving love. Did you know that nine times out of 10, when you hear a bird song, it's a mating call? What is a cricket chirping about? <laughs> it's a mating call. Life-giving love is everywhere. Creation is singing its own version of what in the Bible is called the Song of Songs the great life-giving erotic love poetry of the Song of Songs. We see this poetically right in the book of Genesis, keeping in mind, of course, Genesis is not a science textbook of the way the world came to be. The author of Genesis is not a scientist. He's a lover. He's a poet. He's a mystic. And he's telling with metaphor, with poetic language, with symbol, he's telling the story of God's life-giving love revealed in creation. And so we have all these animals created male and female, and all of them are called to be fruitful and multiply. And then at the apex of the story of creation, we read, male and female, he created them. In the image and likeness of God, he made them, and he blessed them, and he said, be fertile. That's this painting. It's man and woman at the apex of creation's love song. We, male and female, made in the image and likeness of God, male and female, in the call to be fruitful and multiply. We see here, as John Paul II says, we see a religious icon. We see a window into the mystery of God's life giving love. What does human sexuality proclaim? It proclaims God is life-giving love. <laughs> That's what the word gender actually means. Before the modern world got a hold of that word gender and started to deconstruct its original meaning, gender, the word gender, look at the root, gen, G-E-N. It shares the same root as words like generous, generate, progeny, genealogy. I hope this is coming through in the translation in Spanish. I, I would imagine we share lots of similar roots and words and such. So again, in English, generate, generous, progeny, genealogy. What do all these words have in common? That root gen. Do you know what the word gender means? Gen means to produce, give birth to. 
Gender means the manner in which you generate new life. That's your gender. If we're looking at the origin of this word, that's what it means. Gender means the manner in which you generate new life. And that is determined by your genitals. There are only two kinds of genitals. You have genitals that generate with sperm and you have genitals that generate with an egg. And notice the sperm can't do anything without the egg and the egg can't do anything without the sperm. The two genders need one another in order to generate new life. The two genders need one another in order to image the eternal life-givingness of God. Now, let's keep this in mind. This is very important. All that we're saying about this painting, this painting being an image of the eternal exchange of love in the Trinity, and again, what is this painting? It's man and woman, naked without shame, just as God made us to be. That's what this painting is. Forgive me if I didn't make that clear already. Male and female, he made them. In the image and likeness of God, he made them. Naked without shame, he made them. In the call to be fruitful and multiply, he made them. This painting is an icon of heaven, of the eternal life of the Trinity. But be careful, we're not saying God is sexual. God is pure spirit, in which there's no place for the difference of the sexes, as the catechism makes clear. We're not saying God is sexual. Rather, we're saying that this painting, our sexuality, is an echo. It's an echo in the created world of the eternal life-giving exchange of love found within God. In other words, this painting is an image of heaven. Indeed, what image does the Bible use far more than any other to help us understand heaven, to help us understand God's love? Marriage, the call to be fruitful and multiply. Whenever God establishes a covenant of love with humanity, whenever God crosses that abyss from heaven to earth and reveals his covenant love, there is always in scripture the call to be fruitful and multiply why because this painting again is the fundamental image the earthly reflection of god's covenant love the bible begins with marriage with a marriage in an earthly paradise throughout the old testament god speaks of his love for his people as the love of a husband for his bride in the New Testament, the love of the eternal bridegroom is literally enfleshed. When the word is made flesh, he comes, Christ comes as the bridegroom to give up his body for his bride. This is an image from a mystical artist. This, in fact, was Mother Teresa's favorite image of the crucifix. This is called the nuptial crucifix. Every crucifix is a nuptial crucifix. But here the artist makes it explicit that the bridegroom is giving up his body for the bride. That what happened at the cross was the consummation of the marriage between Christ and the church. The woman at the foot of the cross here, of course, it's Mary, but she symbolizes the church here. The catechism says that Mary goes before all of us as bride as the bride of love eternal, which is revealed in Jesus Christ. We need the symbolic meaning there to understand this, right? Of course, she's his mother in the flesh, but the deeper spiritual meaning, she represents the bride. He's the new Adam. She's the new Eve. This is where the mystical, supernatural, spiritual marriage of their hearts is consummated. And we know it's fertile. How do we know it's fertile? What does the new Adam say to the new Eve? He says, woman. Notice he calls her woman. Whenever Jesus calls Mary woman, we're at a wedding. Keep that in mind. He calls her woman and he says, woman, behold your son. And he's referring to St. John, right? The beloved disciple is the mystical offspring 
of the mystical marriage of Christ and the church. See, the call to be fruitful and multiply revealed here in this original painting is fulfilled here. And it comes to consummate fulfillment, ultimate fulfillment at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, which describes heaven as an eternal marriage. Remember what the priest said to the lovers on the blanket? What does what you're doing here have to do with the stars? This painting is an image of heaven. And this is precisely why the enemy is after this painting. The enemy, from the beginning, wants to distort and crumple up this painting. And this is what original sin did to that beautiful image of male and female in the Garden of Eden when we were naked and felt no shame. Our experience of being male and female begins here. It begins with a broken picture. It begins with a twisted, confusing experience. This is why we're in so much pain in our sexuality. Our children, our children, if we do not lead them to God's plan for sexuality, what is God's plan for sexuality? Christ comes into the world to uncrumple what sin has crumpled up. This is authentic sexual education. This is the power of authentic sexual education. It uncrumples for us the original, beautiful, wonderful painting. Otherwise, all we can do is teach our children how to deal with this, right? We don't just want to teach them how to cope with this. We want to invite them into the gift of redemption that restores the original, beautiful, wonderful plan of God for making us male and female. That, my brothers and sisters, is the power of sexual education in the family. But we're back to this basic principle. You cannot give what you do not have. If we are to pass this on to our children, we must receive it deeply ourselves. We must take it in. We must absorb it. We must be on this journey ourselves. If we are not on this journey ourselves of letting our own broken experiences of sexuality be healed, be restored, be redeemed, if we are not on this journey ourselves, then we will be the blind leading the blind. And here, let me underscore, silence is not an option. It is not an option for us in the family to say nothing. If we say nothing, we are throwing our children to the wolves. If we say nothing, our children will take their hunger to the fast food. And that fast food will poison their system. I, I can't underscore this enough. I, I, I would just ask you to reflect on your own upbringing. If you were raised in a Christian home, how many of you would say that in your Christian upbringing, there was open, honest, normal, healthy, regular conversation about God's glorious, beautiful, wonderful plan for erotic desire. I have asked hundreds of thousands of people that question over the 25 years I've been doing this work, and I get about a one to 2% response. The other 98% of us were raised on what I call that starvation diet approach. My brothers and sisters, do not repeat the cycle. Do not remain silent, because if you're silent, if you are not inviting your children to God's banquet, they're going to be taking their hunger to the fast food. What I want to do in our remaining time is provide some suggestions, some, some thoughts for how we can pass this on to our children. 
underscoring number one, you cannot give what you do not have. So this assumes that we are absorbing this teaching more and more ourselves. And I urge you, I urge you, there are so many resources now on John Paul II's Theology of the Body. I urge you to find them and immerse yourself in them. I urge you, if you like my approach, look up some of my videos online. Uh, I, I hope you speak English. Some of them have been translated into Spanish. We have recently at the Theology of the Body Institute, we have provided a Spanish online conference with multiple presentations from multiple speakers, some native Spanish speakers, some English speakers where they've been translated. So there are more and more resources to help you understand theology of the body. I'm just gonna leave that there for now. Everything I say going forward assumes that you are absorbing this vision because if you don't have it, you can't pass it along. Assuming that, now I wanna offer some practical suggestions. How can we pass this vision on to our children? First, I wanna talk about some suggestions for overall general education of our children, and then I'll get more specific. So here are some general thoughts. Think about this. <laughs> Anyone with toddlers know that they are innately selfish, right? It's all about me. It's my toy. It's my this. Everything is self-centered. How do we lead? Remember, educate means to lead forth. How do we lead a self-centered toddler to become a self-sacrificial adult? That's a long journey. You have to have a long-term vision for leading a selfish toddler to become a self-sacrificial adult. Here are some thoughts. Number one, shower your children with authentic love. Shower your children with authentic love love. I'll tell a story here. One of the main architects of the sexual revolution was Hugh Hefner. If you don't know who Hugh Hefner was, uh, he just died maybe a year or two ago. He was an American who founded Playboy magazine, one of the first pornographic magazines in the 1950s. And he was one of the main architects of the sexual revolution. He said this, I started Playboy magazine as a personal response to the hurt and hypocrisy of my strict Christian upbringing. What does he mean? He went on to explain. He said, my parents, my mother and my father were puritanical in a very strict sense, in a very real sense, Puritanism. What does that mean? It's a fearful rejection of the body. Let me, let me go back to this example. When this is our experience of sexuality, we may think the solution, because it looks like rubbish, is to throw it away. But this is not our faith. That's Puritanism. That's a fearful rejection of the body. The Catholic Church condemns that as a heresy. But when we grow up in a so-called Christian environment that has rejected the body, as Hugh Hefner did, he said, my mother never hugged me. She was never close to me. She never showed me signs of affection. He says, I grew up starved for affection. When our genuine need for human touch, for human closeness, for body-to-body -body contact, when that is not properly met, those desires become twisted and they go underground and they come out later in life in all kinds of sexual neurotic behaviors. Now, of course, Hugh Hefner can't blame everything he did on the fact that his mother didn't hug him, but it is important to understand <laughs> that those genuine human needs, when they are not properly met, 
they can come out in very disordered ways. So if we want to raise our children to learn how to love, we have to shower proper love upon them. If you want your children to love properly, then you need to learn to love properly. You need to learn how to shower love on your children. I think here, teaching a proper respect of what the dignity of a person is, is very, very important. In our home, we have five children, by the way, ages 20, almost 23, down to age almost 12. And we're still learning. We're still learning as we go. Uh, we do not have this all figured out. And I've had some very interesting conversations with my older children about ways that they have pointed out to me that they think we got it wrong. So I am, I am not holding myself out as the one who's figured this all out. But from my trials and from my, my uh, you know, the process of trial and error, I can share some of my stories. And in, in our home, my wife and I always thought it very important to help our children understand respect for the dignity of others. And part of that is understanding respect for the freedom of others. For example, if one of our children reached out and grabbed the toy that another child was playing with, we would say, hold on guys, you're not, I'd say to Thomas, if he grabbed the toy from his brother, I'd say, Thomas, you're not respecting your brother's freedom. You're not respecting his dignity as a person. It's just one practical example of trying to instill dignity for the person. Another thing we have to learn here, we have to instill in our children, is a, a proper sense of erotic passion. What do I mean by that? This might be the most important thing I have to share. Erotic passion is not merely sexual passion. Eros, the word eros is obviously related to our sexuality, but it is much broader than that. It's, a, it's an experience of eros whenever we encounter a song that makes us wanna dance. It's an experience of erotic passion whenever we see a sunset and it takes our breath away. And it's, it's an experience of erotic passion whenever we, we experience a good meal or something that just makes our taste buds come alive, right? Those awakening of those experiences that awaken our senses, those are experiences of the goodness of life of the joy of life, of the, the proper pleasure in being a human being. And so we have to instill in our children, this is very important, a proper pleasure principle. Let me explain. Remember those three approaches I spoke of, the starvation diet approach, the fast food approach, and the banquet approach, right? The banquet approach is what we're after, right? Each of those three different approaches have a different pleasure principle. The starvation diet pleasure principle is if it feels good, it's evil, right? This is not our faith. The fast food approach is if it feels good, it's an idol, indulge in it. The banquet approach is if it feels good, if it's pleasurable, it's meant to be an icon, a sign that points us to heaven, right? We could put it this way. The starvation diet negates the world's pleasures. The fast food approach inflates the world's pleasures, whereas the banquet approach sublimates the world's pleasures. What does that mean? Sublimate. It means to lift up, to make sublime right? The experience of a pleasurable meal, the experience of the beauty of nature, the experience of beautiful music or a beautiful story. These experiences, we must inculcate, we must foster these experiences in our children. And we must teach them that the good pleasurable experiences of this life 
are meant to lift us to the eternal joy that awaits us in heaven. Every pleasure in this world is meant to be an icon that points us to heaven. We must be very careful that we do not turn the icons of heaven into idols. In other words, we must teach our children that eros, that they all feel, we feel eros even when we're very, very young. I remember as a little boy hearing a song on the radio that just awakened in me this passion for the eternal. I didn't know to call it that at the time, but that's exactly what it was. We need to foster those experiences in our children, awakening that passion, but we have to teach them that those passions can only be fulfilled as we direct our rocket engines to the stars. In other words, don't aim your desire for happiness at the things that awaken the desire for happiness, right? The best that those things can do is give you a little foretaste, right? There's a danger that we end up treating the foretaste of heaven as heaven itself. And when we do that, we turn the icon into an idol. So we wanna, again, just to, just to uh, summarize, we want to foster in our children experiences of the true, the good, and the beautiful. We want to foster in them an appreciation for music. We want to foster in them an appreciation for the beauty of nature. We want to foster in them an appreciation of good storytelling. What stories do they love? Of course, we have to be discerning here because there's a lot of junk out there. We have to help them distinguish between the wheat and the weeds, right? And just because a story might have some weeds in it, we don't have to throw the whole thing away, but we have to help our children to say, okay, here's the wheat and here are the weeds, right? If we can instill that in our children and help them to recognize that the good things of this life, the pleasurable experiences of this life, and of course, one of the most pleasurable experiences of this life is sexual union that these pleasurable experiences are so many signs and icons that are meant to point us to the stars. We will spare, if we can teach them that, we will spare them a lot of heartache because when we aim our desire for infinite joy at finite pleasure, it never satisfies, right? We have three choices with desire, three choices. We're either going to become a stoic and repress the desire. That's the starvation approach. We're going to become an addict and indulge the desire. That's the fast food approach. Or we can teach our children to be an aspiring mystic where we learn to open our passion for infinite joy to infinite joy. So important. So important. I could say so much more about it. If you're interested in learning more about that, I wrote a whole book about it. It's called Fill These Hearts. Uh, I believe it's been translated in Spanish. Uh, if not, we're going to have to work to get it translated in Spanish. But here, let me move along. We have only about 10 minutes left here. I want to talk about some specific points of specific sexual education of our children. Everything else we've said so far is, is giving us a template and a framework to understand where the specifics sit in, where the, where the specifics fit in is what I meant to say. It's very important here, very specifically, that we foster in our children positive images of their bodies and more specifically, positive images of their genitals, the holiness of their genitals, the sacredness of their genitals, the beauty and goodness of their body as a boy or as a girl. And here I urge you to use proper names for proper body parts. I firmly believe that if a child asks an honest question, they deserve an honest answer. That doesn't mean they deserve all the information that you could possibly give them because there's a time and a place to unfold specifics of sexual education. But for example, 
I remember when uh, my first son was five years old, he, he asked me very plainly, he was sitting in the bathtub and he was looking at his testicles in the bathtub. And he said, Papa, what are these? And I said, those are your testicles. And he said, what are they for? Again, it's an honest question. I should not respond, you're too young to know, or you're too young to ask that question. He's obviously not too young to ask that question because he just did. So he deserves an honest answer. So I remember saying to him, I remember praying, Lord, help me, give me, inspire me, help me to put this in a way that he can understand. And I said, buddy, when you get to be a man, your testicles are going to make seeds. And if you're called to be a husband and a father like I am, you're going to give those seeds to your wife because your wife has a garden and you're going to plant those seeds in her garden. The garden is her womb and your seeds will belong in your wife's garden. And that's how God brings forth babies into the world. So it wasn't too much information. I didn't get into specifics, but it was an honest answer. And I remember he, he looked at his testicles and he said, wow, that's amazing, or something like that. And that's exactly what we want to instill in our children. We want to instill awe and wonder at the beauty, the goodness, the mystery of God's plan for sexuality. We do not want to scold them we do not want to shame them, right? And here I'll tell a story. I met a woman some years ago who as an adult had been uh, a very, had had a very difficult life. She had had a couple abortions. She had had many sexual relationships. And she told me the sad story of when she was a little girl, maybe five or six, and she was in the bathtub and she was, curiously exploring her genitals in the bathtub. And her mother saw her do this and smacked her hand and said, don't touch yourself there, that's dirty. My brothers and sisters, this caused a scar, such a deep scar in that child. The curiosity, which is normal and natural, was shamed and scolded, and it went underground. And by the age of 10, that girl was a habitual masturbator. Can she blame it all on her mother and her mother's scolding? No, she can't blame it all on her mother. But you can't understand it without that as well. That did play a significant role. By the age of 10, she was a habitual masturbator. By the age of 14 or 15, she had lost her virginity. And she had a string of sexual relationships, with, which led to so much pain in her life, so much pain in her life. John Paul II tells us that the way we live and understand our sexuality is largely what determines whether we have a good lot in life or a bad lot in life. And that's very true. Because the way we live and understand our sexuality will determine whether we live and experience authentic love or not. And that determines whether we flounder or whether we flourish. So much is at stake here. I also want to uh, suggest this as a, as a very practical suggestions, suggestion for sexual education within the, within the family. Do it in the context of prayer. Every night since my children were born, and even before they were born, I would pray this into the womb when my children were in their mother's womb. And, and here I want to add that the church in a document called The Truth and Meaning of Human Sexuality, I believe it came out in 1996, I would urge you to read it. The subtitle is called Guidelines for Education Within the Family. It's a wonderful do document, The Truth and Meaning of Human Sexuality. I'm sure you can get it in Spanish on the Vatican's website. Please, please read it. In that document, the church says that education 
in God's plan for sexuality must begin in the womb when the parents receive the child as a gift lovingly from God. That's the beginning of their education. And that education must continue uninterrupted throughout the course of that child's life. And so obviously sexual education does not just mean where does baby where do babies come from? Sexual education means why did God make us male and female in the image and likeness of God? And that's an education that begins in the womb and unfolds throughout the course of life. But here's my suggestion, very practical. Ever since my children were little, we put this in the context of prayer. When we would tuck them in at night, here's how prayers would go. We would say, thank you for making mommy to be a woman. Thank you for making daddy to be a man. Thank you for calling mommy and daddy to the sacrament of marriage. And thank you for bringing John, Paul, and Thomas, and Beth, and Isaac, and Grace into the world through mommy and daddy's love. Thank you for making the boys to be boys. Help them to grow into strong men to give their bodies away in love. Thank you for making the girls to be girls. Help them to grow into strong women to give their bodies away in love. If they're called to marriage, please bless their future spouse wherever they may be. If they're called to make a gift of their bodies, either as a priest or a religious sister, please prepare them to make the gift of their body in that way. And so all of my children, I'm sure, could recite that prayer from heart because they've heard it so many times. Day after day after day after day, they've heard that prayer. They've understood at some level. And again, we've not done this perfectly uh, my, my older children have told us all kinds of ways that we've made mistakes, and we're still learning, and we're still making mistakes. But nonetheless, I think each of my children would recognize that they've understood from a very early age that sex and God belong together, and God has a beautiful plan for our sexuality. He's leading us to a banquet. That's his goal. His goal is to direct our rocket engines to the stars so that at long last, we can live in the eternal marriage, in the eternal exchange of life-giving love, of which this painting, remember our painting, this painting is just the window to that eternal reality. What does the love of man and woman have to do with the stars? What does human sexuality, what does our creation as male and female have to do with the stars? Everything. The power of sexual education in the family is to lead the family to that eternal union. My brothers and sisters, wherever you are in your own journey, I invite you to continue the journey. Do not be discouraged. Even if you were not educated in this vision growing up, I was not, very few of us are, it's never too late. It is never too late to take it up and take it in. And it's never too late. I don't care if you have adult children. Maybe you never said anything to them at all about God's plan for sexuality. It's never too late to sit down with your adult children and say, you know what? I'm learning some things now that I never understood before. And I'm recognizing, looking back at the way we raised you, how we didn't pass this on to you because nobody passed it on to us. But could we even today, together, could we take up a study of this? Could we learn together? My own parents have come to me in my adult life and said similar things and have asked me for forgiveness for the ways that they were not able to pass this on when I was growing up. And here's an analogy. I'll, I'll end with this. The analogy I use here is my parents demanded of me that I be chaste. And the analogy here is, but they, they never taught me how to be chaste, right? They demanded that I be chaste, but they never taught me how to be chaste. And that's like demanding a child 
be a concert pianist without ever giving the child piano lessons, right? If you want your children to make beautiful music with their sexuality, <laughs> we have to give them piano lessons. And if you want to teach them how to make beautiful music, you must yourself learn how to make beautiful music. However broken we are, and we're all broken here, the Lord's love, his mercy can come into our brokenness. However broken we are, his light can come in there and we can begin to open up like flowers and become the men and women we're created to be. That is the power of sexual education within the family. I hope what I have shared has inspired. I'm sure it has challenged. Be not afraid of the challenge. I, I know what Raphael, Raphael is doing is, is going to provide lots of more resources for you to continue your journey. I hope my presentation has been a positive step for you in that journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher, for this wonderful presentation. You're very and welcome, brother. All your listeners, all our listeners, enjoy your talk and uh, are waiting for more. And what is amazing is that too much more is to come. We will be waiting anxiously for our first TUB course next summer. Uh, one little thing also, Christopher, you talked about your book, Feel These Hearts, and uh, you didn't remember that it was already translated in Spanish. As a matter of fact, I did it. It's oh, called, good. That's right. I forgot. Yes. And it's called Llena Estos Corazones. It's available in Amazon, so you can, you can find it in Amazon. And now, Christopher, I'm going to switch into Spanish, so to say goodbye to our, our audience, okay? Okay, very good. And listen to Spanish, and maybe uh, you can take a, a internet Spanish course, so next time you can give a lesson. In Spanish. Okay. okay. Pues muchísimas gracias a todos por estar con nosotros en esta conferencia, que estoy seguro que nos ha aportado muchísima luz. Os pedimos perdón por los problemas que haya podido ocasionar la, los problemas de conexión. Realmente hoy hemos tenido muchos problemas. Eh, se ha ido la luz en la universidad y todo nuestro equipo ha tenido que volar a sus casas para que este evento no se suspendiera. Obviamente los medios que tenemos en nuestras casas no son los mismos que tenemos en la universidad, pero esto ha pasado. Nunca se va la luz en la universidad. De hecho, se fue en toda la zona de la universidad y por eso este evento eh, en un momento dado se vio comprometido, pero pues nos hemos encomendado a Dios y a la Virgen para que esto saliera. Nuevamente pedimos perdón a todos y os animamos a que sigáis adelante y que sintonicéis en este canal y tenéis a vuestra disposición los, los vídeos, perdón, los vídeos que están puestos para las siguientes conferencias. Eh, os recordamos también que tenéis a vuestra disposición un link para inscribiros si queréis en el curso de experto universitario en sexualidad y afectividad, eh, que es, os insisto, es maravilloso, yo lo he tomado, y eh, está pendiente de lo que está por venir. Muchas cosas están por venir, sobre todo, pues, eh, lo bueno se hace esperar, y si este no ha podido ser nuestro primer TOB1 en, en España, pues, será el año que viene. O sea que, pues, hasta la próxima. Christopher, thank you very much. And I hope I can see you in October. I don't know if I can, because I was supposed to go to Philadelphia next week, but you know that oh, yes. it's closed. But so I hope in October we will be there. I hope so too, brother. I hope so too. Thank you very much. And uh, bless you all. Okay. Bye.